think that is a bit better. As you know, or you might not know, we, we don't have a, a permanent facility, so when we have uh, needed funerals or places for courses and uh, so many things like that, you have always just been a blessing to us for, for things like that. And so just so grateful for you as a congregation and as, as a church. And um, as I said, it's a joy to be here and it's wonderful to have uh, my family here with me as well this morning. And so happy Mother's Day from us to you as well. And to all of you moms that are here today, uh, just God bless you and may you be loved by your family today. And so uh, have a wonderful, wonderful day. You may or might may not know that today is traditionally what we would call Ascension Sunday. Uh, Ascension uh, was on Thursday, and today is the day that the church globally recognizes and remembers this, this wonderful, significant occasion that we call the Ascension found in Acts chapter 1. And we're going to be there today, and we're going to be looking in uh, that passage. And so if you have your Bibles, turn there so long to, to Acts chapter 1. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to warn of a potential danger that happens when we look at historical passages. You go, ah, oh, every year, okay, uh, I know about the ascension, I know about this. And, and these historical events, we can often go with nostalgia, or we can dial out and go, oh man, I've heard this Last year, and I heard this the year before, and, and it's a danger that we can have as, as followers of Jesus. And, and I want to just share something that I've we've been a bit of a journey on. And, and, and the, the joy is that we are followers of Jesus, and these events have implications for us following Jesus today. And so at the start, I want us to be aware of and be encouraged that and what we're going to look at is what does the ascension of Jesus mean for me as a follower of Jesus today and tomorrow and going forward? You know, something that is always so striking to me is the word Christian. It's used three times in the New Testament and once as a descriptive term. But the word disciple as a follower of Jesus is used 530 times. And so the better understanding of who I am as someone who loves Jesus is that I am a disciple. I follow Jesus, and following Jesus is doing life with Jesus today. And, and this, the historical implications of things I read about Jesus enable me to do life with Jesus. And so that means that this historical event, the ascension, has implications for me and has value for me today. Even though it was a once-off historical event that we remember and we look back on, the value, the implications, has meaning right now. And so we're going to look at some of those today as followers of Jesus. Because I want to do life with Jesus. I get to do life with Jesus. And, and so this enables that in, in greater ways. And so I'm just so excited because... As a community, we are together followers of Jesus. So this has even impact on us as a community of followers of Jesus. So, Acts chapter 1. And we'll read from verse 1 through uh, to verse 10. So in my former book, so the author uh, of Acts being Luke the historian, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was still alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates uh, the father has set by his own authority. 
But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up in the sky as he was going, and suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you still standing here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who was taken from you into the heavens will come back in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Let's actually pray as we just read God's word. Jesus, as we remember this significant event, we give you just all the praise and the glory for who you are and what you've done. And I pray that your word would would really encourage our hearts and lifts our spirits as we see what it means for us to be a community of followers of you who are on mission for you, for your kingdom. And so we ask that you would speak to us through your word, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. What a significant event. And uh, again, just to be a fly on the wall and to have witnessed the disciples around Jesus and Jesus actually just ascending and just leaving uh, before their, their very eyes and then kind of looking around and going like, what do we do now? And again, this is so important because this event catalyzes and activates what we are now, uh, the church, the body of Christ here on earth. And so, as I said, implications. And the first one, uh, just so important for us, and to get us going on, on the first implication on the ascension is just to share a little bit about myself. Uh, one of my favorite pastimes and hobbies is reading. And one of the favorite types of books that I love reading is called Speculative Fantasy. And uh, if you've never heard of that term before, think Lord of the Rings. And Lord of the Rings was made popular by its uh, movies. Uh, if you haven't read the books, they, they're maybe not as, uh, as engaging, a little bit longer uh, than the movies. But that's the, the kind of books I, I love to read. And uh, there's usually a pattern in most books like that. Uh, there is a bad guy or a bad group of guys, and uh, they've oppressed everyone, and they are evil. And then there's the small minority of good guys, and usually a hero. And uh, everything leads to a confrontation with the bad guy and the hero. And against all odds, the hero uh, prevails, the bad guy is defeated. And then there's usually a new king that is crowned and uh, everybody lives in peace happily ever after. And I love stories like that. Especially at the moment when the new good king is crowned and the crown is placed on his head and there's so much uh, triumph and jubilation and happiness knowing that victory and peace has come uh, to all the good folk in the land. Evil is gone and vanquished. And I love that because I think, I think God laughs or, or, or smiles when he sees people writing about that because I see so much of that in the life and the work of Jesus. Because, for example, like in the physical realm at the crucifixion of Jesus, the Roman soldiers were just carrying out their, you, you know, their duty from their officers. Go arrest this troublemaker who has been causing some problems for for Rome. And the governor just passes a legal decree going, yes, go execute him with the other criminals, and let's just get on with our day. And now, ah, yes, another crucifixion. And, and Rome wasn't paying too much attention. They were just carrying out what Rome did. You killed and executed people who were troublemakers. But little did they know that in the spiritual realm, there was a far greater battle that was raging. That was the battle where the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. And the battle that Jesus was raging was against the enemies that you and I had no hope of defeating, being sin, shame, and death. Oh, the songs you sung this morning, I was so encouraged by the words because, man, where's the boast of sin and death? Where is the boast of shame? No, because in that battle, Jesus defeated it. 
And I know Easter was a few weeks ago, but it's so important because it's tied into the ascension of Jesus because he walked out of that grave as the first of the resurrection, leaving behind our enemies, and the king did battle on our behalf against our enemies that we were held captive to, and he had the victory. And here this King Jesus is in victory. And in my mind, when I see the ascension, the battle is done. The King is victorious and he's en route to his coronation because he's ascending from the work done on our behalf in a place where we could have never gone. And he beats the enemies we had no hope of beating And in victory, he ascends to the right hand of the Father, where he's not only king, but the king of kings. And he's not only Lord, but Lord of lords. And the implications of the ascension is that my Savior is alive, and he is sitting on the throne in victory over this life and the life to come. So important that that's What I live in as a follower of Jesus, my risen, living Savior, King Jesus, ascended to the throne. He is crowned the King of kings over everything in existence. I love it. Scripture gave us a bit of a foreshadowing into this, and um, I love the book of Esther. Uh, kind of an obscure book in the Old Testament. And in in just two quick minutes, there's a moment where Esther, as the queen, has to enter into the throne room of King Xerxes. Now she knows, right, King Xerxes, he is the king of Persia. Persia at that time ran everything. They were the empire in the world at the time. And to go into the throne room of the most powerful man on earth without invitation, she risked certain death. And she did that knowing she needed to, for the sake of her people, go into the presence of the most powerful man and appeal for mercy. But we know that with the death and resurrection of Jesus, again, we sang it this morning and I was so encouraged we know that there was something that separated us from the very presence of God. The Holy of Holies, there was this massive veil. And to enter into that, the priest or the high priest could only do that once a year. And if he had sinned, and if he hadn't done things properly, he would die instantly in the presence of God. I don't know if you know this, but um, when the high priest would do that, he would have rope tied around one foot and bells on the other. And so if the bell stopped moving, they know he would have died in the presence of God and they would drag him out with the rope. That's what it was like to be in the presence of God. And we know that that veil was torn top to bottom at the death of Jesus, miraculously because of its height and weight, meaning that that which separated us from the throne, the, the, the intimate place of God was removed And like Esther having to walk into that throne room, risking death in search of mercy, Hebrews tells us this, uh, Hebrews 4.16, And let us approach God's throne with confidence, or with grace, the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Understand the implications of the victory of Jesus, the ascension into that throne that he's sitting on, where he is the king of kings. We don't just have, like Esther, a throne room of the most powerful man on earth. We have the throne of thrones with the king of kings and the Lord of lords in a place of complete victory over our greatest enemies, sin, shame, and death. He is sitting there in victory, and there is now no longer fear of approaching that very place. Everything that would hinder and restrict and cause us to fear going into that place has been removed. There he now says, come, let us approach that throne, the invitation. And how can we approach it? With confidence. There there's grace and mercy in our time of need. The implications of 
the ascension means that no matter what I'm going through, it doesn't matter what I'm facing, and I know life gets heavy, and I know that uh, there are weighty things that are filling our lives, and that's why Paul in Corinthians says, in, light, in, in these light and momentary troubles, you know, how, how can somebody say that our troubles are light and momentary? Does he know what I'm going through? Now, does he know what my financial situation is? Do you know what uh, the crisis I'm facing with my health or my job or what's, what's going on? How, how dare he say troubles are light and momentary? But he understands that we have victory in, in, in Jesus. And so, yes, things are painful. But can anything take away what I have in Jesus? Because he is my king in this life and the life to come. And his victory is now and for eternity. And so, yes, I get to praise him. So I said, worship, uh, I don't know if you saw my script. We get to praise him even in the valley. And I get to praise him when it's not going okay. Because I am living life at the end of the battle I live on this side of the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, and I entered life waiting for his return. And my greatest battle has been fought already. And so I live in victory. I live in his victory. That I get to wake up tomorrow morning no matter what is going on, and I can praise him, and I get to go before my king. My King Jesus, my Savior, and I get to approach Him with confidence, not trepidation, not guilt, not shame, with confidence, knowing that I will receive grace and mercy for what I have need for. Isn't that amazing? And so I'm so encouraged by this. When Paul thinks about all of this, and he, he writes in Romans, Romans 8 verse 1, for now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I don't stand in judgment. I don't stand guilty or condemned because I live with the victory of Jesus. And as a follower of Jesus, I share in that with him. And that has an implication for me today in light of all that I am going through. So one of the first major implications of the ascension is I live in victory because of Jesus. Uh, the second and one that is so important and one of the main reasons of the ascension is the Spirit. Jesus repeatedly told the disciples, I need to go so that the Father can send the Spirit. Now, Pentecost is coming and um, you're going to have a sermon maybe next week on, um, on, on um, Pentecost as Steve is, is going to be coming and joining you guys from Riverside. But Jesus repeatedly told them, guys, I have to go. I can't stay with you. I need to go so that the Father can send the Spirit. And I know this would be hard, right? Because imagine having Jesus with you. Hey, that we, we saw in the Gospels and uh, post uh, the resurrection, having the physical Jesus with us would be amazing. But something even more spectacular happens. And again, knowing what happened at Pentecost, how that was described, and the Holy Spirit came down to the guys that were gathered in the upper room, about 125 people. And if you, if you know the story, it's described as how tongues of fire kind of came and separated on each and every one of you. And I don't know if you know how much uh, or how significant that is. And maybe when you heard the word fire, some alarm bells were going off for you. Because every single time we see the powerful presence of God with His people in the Old Testament, it is described as fire. Think about when He leads His people out of slavery in Egypt and into uh, the Promised Land. It's a cloud of fire in, in the day and a pillar of fire at night. Think about when Moses goes up onto Mount Sinai for the receiving of the Ten Commandments. There was thunder and fire and smoke. When Moses meets with God in the tabernacle, it says like a cloud of fire descends on the tabernacle. 
And so it's with God's consecration, whenever God's there with His people in a significant moment, He is there in presence and in power described by the liking of fire. And so when uh, the Holy Spirit comes and the church, all the believers are gathered together in one place, His presence comes, it's fire like He always did. But now it's not just in one place at one time, but separates and goes to each person that's in the room. And what he's saying is, I'm now consecrating the church. And who is the church? Was the people. And I love this verse, Ephesians 2.22. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Just feel the implications of that. It's like the disciples didn't want Jesus to go. Jesus is going, you don't understand what's coming. You don't understand how much better things are going to be. I'm going to the Father. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm not leaving you alone. I'm sending the Spirit. And the implications of me going up is so the Spirit can come down. And the Spirit comes down, consecrates the believers. There's God's blessing and God's presence in every single person gathered there. And the implications of that understanding, as Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, you are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by His Spirit. Think tabernacle. Think temple. Think the pillar of cloud and fire. God lives with his people and his presence has always been there. And so Jesus never left us. But now we don't have just one Jesus. We have the Spirit empowering every single follower of Jesus. And they together are being built into the living temple. The place that God lives and dwells by his Spirit. Man, what amazing to know that I'm, I'm, this isn't a building. I mean, isn't that, <clears throat> sorry, isn't that one of the biggest mistakes that we make when we say church is a building? And I know we go, I go, I'm going to church, and I always like to tell people, rather say I'm going to where the church meets, and it meets at that building. But the church is the people, the followers of Jesus, with the indwelling of His presence where he dwells, where he lives. And so that is just such a wonderful encouragement for us that I live in victory and he's given me his presence and I live with believers. We are the the church. And that then brings us to uh, the third implication, which is the church being the body. And the ascension changes the nature of engaging Jesus. And, and again, the church being people are described, you are the body of Christ. And so again, just imagine one Jesus on the globe. How does everybody get to experience Jesus? No, with him leaving, with, the, with him ascending to the Father, with him sending the Spirit, and how that Spirit is all of us together um, being the dwelling place where God lives by his Spirit. But the understanding of that is then I am the body of Christ. That me and you and all churches around the globe, what we are is Jesus to the rest of the world. It's amazing. How how does the world today know that Jesus is kind? Well, when we, the church, are kind, and when we love people, people get to know, oh, wow, that is what Jesus is like. Jesus is the head of the body. We, the body, the hands, the feet, we get to love people. Again, how do people know that you are my disciples? Jesus said, by how you love God. One another, John 13, 35, is so uh, important as we understand the role of engaging and what Jesus set up is, this is how people are going to know what love is. 
This is how people are going to know who I am. Is now you are the body. You go and love one another. Love the world. Be kind. Be generous. Uh, love well. Uh, handle trouble with grace and joy. And turn everything to praise. People are going to know who I am and what I'm about and want to be part of this. By this all men will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. We see from Acts 1 with the ascension how it moves into how the church operated. Acts 2, we see how they loved one another, met regularly. In fact, they, they met almost daily in each other's homes in the temple courts and uh, enjoying the teaching of the apostles, even selling possessions to give to everyone who had need. The way they operated as the body of Christ was so radical that people were daily wanting to be a part of what Jesus did and wanted to be a part of this thing called the body of Christ, the church. We see it spreading across cultures. We see people being set apart for mission. And in the ascension, Jesus said, but when the Spirit comes, you will be my witnesses. It sets the mission of the body. That what your job is going to be is to proclaim me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we see how that took place throughout the whole book of Acts as they were the body of Christ, loved one another, served one another, were kind to one another, even to people who were different to each other, different cultures, languages, people groups. They had to iron out a few things and, 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 and had a few speed bumps along the way, but they went and they took what Jesus said and lived it out as the body. And so we have just this incredible implications for us that, that me as an individual follower of Jesus, together with everyone else who are following Jesus in community, that I, I'm living in victory. And... I've been given his presence and it empowers me for life. And he's made me part of this global thing called the church. Not a building, but his body on earth for people to hear about him and to witness what he's done and to experience his love, his grace, his kindness, his mercy. As I live in community and experience this and with disciples being loved and loving and Man, the implication isn't just this nostalgic thing that I remember once a year, a couple weeks after Easter. Oh, yes, man, that's that, that day when Jesus went up to heaven. No, the implications of that are far more reaching. That it has implications for me today as I'm living in victory. Knowing that I've got the presence of God with me. That I'm part of this body of believers. And church, this is what it means for you guys as well. Because these implications are for you as Bracken Downs Community Church. And, and, and I'm going to encourage you with this. I know it's been a rough start to the year. And you might not be feeling great about yourself or just what's going on in your life. But the mission and the truth <clears throat> of Jesus never changes. His empowering presence doesn't change when circumstances change. Sometimes we just have to knuckle down and, and, and uh, you know, just maybe get a little bit more grit going, but you're still a community of disciples, followers of Jesus, who he loves, who the victory of Jesus is still present for you right now, even though it might not feel or look like victory. He's still on the throne, and he's still your king and my king and the king and the head of this church. And his presence is still with every single one of you as you're being built together, the dwelling place which God lives by his presence, and the mission never changes. The fact that we are his body, and he tells us, go, be my witnesses, Love me, love each other here in your Jerusalem, your Judea, wherever you go, outside of your normal places, and unto the ends of the earth that people get to see and know that there is a Savior, Jesus. And people need that. 
And you guys are still a community of believers that this is true for. And circumstances don't change that. Because our Savior is eternal. And while things are temporary and fleeting in this life, he's, as I said, he's king in this life and the life to come. And because he gave us the mission that doesn't change. And our desire to love people well and our desire to love each other well and our desire to see the kingdom established on earth as it is in heaven doesn't change. And so I want you to be encouraged that circumstances don't change the power of God and it doesn't diminish the victory of our Savior and it doesn't dilute the mission that we're on and that we get to love Jesus well in spite of what anything the world throws at us. In spite of anything that comes our way, I'm still part of the greatest thing that's ever happened. It's the death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus while we wait his glorious return. I'm part of that, and that doesn't change. Right, so I'm going to pray, and while I'm praying, the music team's going to come up, and then I'm going to pray again, but this time I'm going to pray for us as a church, but then I'm going to pray when the team comes up, I'm going to pray for moms. All right, so that's where we're going. Jesus, I'm so grateful for your word. I'm so grateful for what it means for us now. I'm so grateful for the implications that I get to live in victory and that I get to experience your presence in my life, Jesus, and that I'm part of your body and what an amazing thing it is. And the encouragement that what it means in my life and so, Jesus, I want to pray for this community of believers who loves you so well. Jesus, I want to pray that they would experience and be reminded of your victory and what this victory means for every single one of us. And that they would be reinvigorated for your work, what it means to be a body, the body of Christ that gets to love one another, be followers and disciples of you, Jesus. Thank you. But Jesus, with joy, I also want to pray for every single mom in this room. Everybody who plays a role in loving and caring and nurturing. Jesus, thank you for that blessing. Thank you for the role that they play and the gift that you've blessed them with. So Jesus, I pray that every single mom and grand and nurturing woman in this church would experience your presence and the blessing in their life. Jesus, I know. I know what my own mom went through with me. And I know the role's not easy and, and, and the stress and the weight of motherhood. But what a gift from you, Jesus. And we ask that your presence would be them in a, in a real special way. They would experience your presence and your empowering for the task, Jesus. We bless you for that, Jesus. We pray for our moms.